All right, welcome to the Low Carb Leader Podcast. Uh, today's guests are Maria and Craig Emmerich. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so why don't you uh, introduce yourself to our watchers or our listeners? So Maria, you want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, my name is Maria, and uh, the reason why I got into ketogenic diets is because I grew up overweight and very unhealthy. and. I guess how it started was I went to the doctor when I was about 17 and um, I left that doctor with three different prescriptions, one for an acid blocker, one for anti, it was an antidepressant. And the third one was, um, I was basically told I had PCOS, which is a fertility that is kind of like a diabetes that affects female fertility. And uh, I was told I could do nothing about it except for take this. But what happened was that same week I went to the vet because my dog was losing patches of her hair and the vet said, what are you feeding her? Hello, something that I've never been asked at the doctor, you know? Um, I just remember my doctor saying, oh, I get acid reflux when I drink water. And now I'm like, dude, that's so not normal. You know, that's right. not the way it's supposed to be. Um, and so right then and there, I decided I wanted to go to school for nutrition and exercise physiology. And um, I, I didn't do that when I first graduated. I was a rock climbing guide. <laughs> but um, things happen in life. Um, Craig lost his job, which forced us to do this. But we really love it. We wake up every morning and we enjoy it so much. But that's kind of how I started. Do you want to? So I'm Craig, I'm Maria's husband. Uh, I started out in, I actually had a degree in electrical engineering. Um, did that for a long time, systems engineering, uh, uh, testing and all that. And once, as we said, you know, the change happened in our life, I started helping with the business, but also educating myself on nutrition. And, you know, I've spent, I don't know, the past six, seven, eight years studying nutrition now uh, and what's interesting about it is uh, coming at it from a kind of systems perspective looking at inputs and outputs you know, kind of like an engineering mind I think has actually helped me a lot in understanding uh, how the body works but also if you see a lot of the leaders right now in uh, the science behind keto and, and nutrition are coming from these engineering backgrounds which is kind of interesting like Ivor Cummings uh, Dave Feldman you know, there's all these engineers, Marty Kendall, they're all coming from an engineering standpoint with that kind of systems approach to things. And I think it really helps in the long, long term. Do they all wear that shirt? <laughs> Isn't that a great shirt we <laughs> wore for you? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's awesome. Uh, so those that have been uh, listening to the podcast for a long time will remember that Marie and I did a Facebook Live from Colorado a while back, maybe... It was last year. Last year, yeah. Yeah, super fun. Yeah, and it was uh, it was freezing there in Colorado, freezing. Yeah. And Maria was out running. It was like it was so cold, ten thousand feet, and yeah, it was about ten, 10 below. below zero. I think. Oh yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. yeah <laughs> that's funny. Hardcore, hardcore exercise. Getting our cold therapy on, right? Exactly. So you guys wrote a book. You have a new book out. Uh, yep. Te before um, we talk about the book, talk about what led up to writing the book what was the kind of the motivation behind that <laughs> misinformation so, well yeah that's part of it um you know we the, the researching i had i'd been doing i've been learning a lot of new things uh you know our last nutrition book that maria wrote by herself was called keto adapted and that sold really well and people uh it's kind of like when you dabble when you're just learning about keto yeah and it's a good starter but it uh you know, a lot of people really enjoyed that book, but we've learned so much since then that it, we thought it was time to kind of update, put, it. update it, not only to get the you know latest science and information out there in a really easy to understand format. That's one of the things I think we're both really good at is I was in product management for a long time. And the thing you have to do there is explain very complicated computer systems to customers. So you got to be able to translate something very technical to something really easy to He's understand. He's really good at that. And so that's what I think that has helped me a lot with uh, pulling into this book, really complicated uh, science, but writing in a way that's really easy to understand and grasp. Um, but anyway, we so we came into this and we 
thought, well, let's write this together because I've got this all this science that I can add. She's got she Maria is like hormones and all the, an expert on all these other components that I'm not. So we just it was natural for us to kind of put this together. Yeah, and we wanted we know that not everybody likes to cook like I do, and so we wanted to make in the back a uh, pantry list and actually meal plans that are no cook, no baking, none of that. You don't have to turn the stove on. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Uh, so the title of the book is Keto: The Complete Guide yep. to Success on the Ketogenic Diet, Including Simplified Science and No Cook Meal Plans. That's a good. Yeah. That's a good title. So yeah. how how was it writing a book together? You know, we work together all day long. We homeschool our kids together. We do everything together. So um, I guess what's funny is we hiked the Colorado Trail together when I was, I think, 17 years old. Um, and my mom said, oh, my gosh, because I'm such an introvert and I, I'm a loner. I like to hunt by myself. My mom's like, if you can last that long with Craig, you guys will get married. And I was like, what? I was 17. I didn't want to hear about marriage, but it's so true. He's like the only person that I can hang out with yeah. for a really long period of time. Well, but awesome. it really wasn't, I don't think it was, we're just used to working. Yeah. Together. And I think it was kind of a tag team kind of thing where, you know, I would take the boys while she was doing parts and then she took the boys camping while I was writing big chunks of, you know, chapters. But then we would get together, we walk every day together, we chat about this stuff all the time. So we're really on the same page. It's not like um, writing a book with someone that differs opinions on you. Yeah. Right, right. So how long did it take you to write it? A year. Yeah, pretty much this past year. Well, even more than that, because we've been always putting stuff in, but once we, like, got an outline and got going... And then the editing process is months and, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's intense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the book, the book is uh, amazing. Uh, so kind of, let's kind of walk through the structure of the book. So uh, what, what's the outline? And I know both of you contributed in different ways. So kind of uh, walk us through that. Sure. Uh, I started out by kind of peeling back the onion a bit. And, and the whole book is kind of a peeling back of an onion and peeling back the layers, you know, to get to those root causes of disease or root causes of obesity. And, uh, you know, starting it out, I think was, I wanted to set the tone for how did we get here? You know, how did we get here as a country, as a, you know, society where, you know, obesity is, is so prevalent and it's alarming when you come to some of the root causes of this. And one of the big root causes was in the seventies, the sugar industry paid large sums of money to manipulate studies that they so the, it's much like it's it's uh, it draws a very good parallel to the tobacco tobacco industry they knew their product was dangerous and was hurting people they actively and 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 there's a whole bunch of references in the book of articles that uncovered these documents where they went and paid uh researchers to basically find connections to fat and heart disease to right. take the take the focus off of sugar and heart disease and they knew that sugar is what caused it it's what the inflammation is what caused it but they wanted to find connections and this all led to the you know the ansel keys the right. the villa you know uh, making fat the enemy for 50 years which really got us to where we are today yeah and you and mentioned that's how, and you start out with the flawed dietary guidelines Right. And, <laughs> yeah. and, the book, and that's, it's so true. It's still, it's still there today. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not going away fast. And, and with so much of this uh, stuff, it's always, you know, follow the money and that's where you're going to find the motivation, the, you know, and the same thing is here, you know, starting with the sugar lobby, you know, nowadays with, you know, things like cholesterol and the, st you know, statin companies and the profits motives there these things don't go away easy because there's too much money behind it. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things I think we wanted this book to be is, you know, a piece that can start pulling people. 
in the right direction. That reminds me too, we have a little piece, we have um, modifications for disease and we talk about cancer, but this reminds me yesterday, I was messaged by a woman who her friend's daughter is suffering from cancer, this little girl that's about my boy's age. And so we made her pictures and we're sending books and stuff. And she said, yeah, watch her do shots of canola oil like a boss. I was like, no, they can't even get keto right. Like they're having her do canola oil shots. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. And we that that we as well touch on in this these early Different chapters oils. talking about the the sources of disease. You know, and those those uh, vegetable and seed oils are one of the big problems. Those omega six oils that are too easily oxidized and causing inflammation. But I'll do presentations at you know hospitals or whatever and. Uh, I remember a dietitian right before me spoke about how to stay away from saturated fats and use canola oil and vegetable oils. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be like one speech and then a total contradictory speech. But it is what it is. So you you mentioned problems caused by too much sugar. Talk a little bit about that, like what um, what you see in your practice and what you've learned in your research. Oh, my gosh. I, I mean, sugar is inflammation we know that that's you know the stem of all of these diseases really you know we're, we're changing our lifestyle to you know uh just overwhelming yeah. amounts of sugar yeah there's a chart in the book showing you know back to the 1800s to now the average oh. at just just added sugar to the diet and it, it's from you know, very small amounts. It's just a straight line yeah, up and crazy. it's not stopping. But you, know? you remember a little house on the prairie, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, you remember Laura Ingalls Wilder? Yeah. She got one piece of candy a year, and that was at <laughs> Christmas. And now we feed our kids cereal and skim milk. That's what I grew up on. And that's like a huge bowl of sugar. Right. And right. then we expect them to sit in a desk and learn for Focus. eight hours a day. And, <clears throat> you know, it's just, it's really hard. And, um, I uh, have a lot of type 1 diabetics uh, or families with children with type 1. And first of all, the endocrinologist always say it says keto is going to kill them. Um, but one in particular, I think the boy was 12 and he got an A plus on his math test. And you know what the teacher gave him? A huge bag of Skittles. Nice. And the mom, yeah, type 1. And the mom's like, is she trying to kill him? Like, come on. But that's that's what we're... You know, candy's not um, a luxury today. It's we feel that as parents, we want to give our kids the world, and so we always want to say yes to them. When in reality, you know, I wish my parents would have said no to right, me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, oh, go ahead, Craig. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I really like you. Uh, in the book, you have this disease tree. That, that's a yeah. pr- pretty cool concept. Talk a little bit about that. How you came uh, up well, with it? Cool graphic. Yeah, I guess. yeah, it's a cool yeah. graphic. Yeah, that's, I, Ivor Cummings. He was the inspiration for that. He has uh, a version of that in his presentations, um, and I thought it was such a engineering way to look at things. You know, having this uh, tree where the roots or the root causes of disease, right, are all of these things that we get wrong today. You know, whether it's these, you know, vegetable oils, whether it's, you know, the, the, the too many carbs in the diet, Stay uh, not, from saturated fat. yeah, not, uh, avoidance of fat, the not having enough sunlight and vitamin D, um, all of these root causes and not enough exercise, you know, all of these things that lead to dysfunction and the end result, you know, on the branches is all of your, uh, chronic diseases, whether it's, you know, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, Crohn's, all of these yeah. things that stem from these root prop, root causes, you know, very new. One thing that processed foods do as well is in addition to ramping up the sugar and carbohydrates uh, and they're empty calories, so you don't get any nutrients. And we talk a lot about having nutrient dense foods is so important uh, for overall health, but also for reversing you know, damage and disease. So, you know, all of these things contribute um, and they're all important to take a look at to, to get your body to heal. Yeah. Uh, your engineering background, as I, as I look through your book, there, it's a, uh, it's right through there. I can see it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Charts, uh, diagrams. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so 
Talk about uh, what is a well-formulated ketogenic diet. So mm-hmm. most of the, probably most of the listeners or watchers ha- have an idea of it, but what's, yep. what's ideal? What are the ideal foods you want to have and what are the uh, foods you want to avoid? Well, I'll talk about what it looks like from like a macro standpoint, and then we can talk yeah. about well, how to do it that way. But one of the things that, and this is a little different than the messaging that's out there in some of the mainstream uh, groups, there's some that are that are on this, you know, science side, some aren't. But the real thing to, to uh, make it a well-formulated ketogenic diet is to get your carbohydrates low. So, you know, we usually say like 20 grams of total carbs or less. We're carnivores over here. To ensure, (laughs) yeah, yeah, me too. To to ensure, you know, they're in that ketogenic state. Uh, Then protein is a goal. And that's because, you know, if you you are under on your protein amount for that day or on average for the week, you're going to lose a little bit of lean mass. I mean, it's just that you you you're all constantly getting that amino acid turnover in your muscles so you have to replenish it so it's moderate protein it's not high protein uh, we we recommend about 0.8 times your lean mass that's your protein goal so it's based on how much mu- lean mass you have how much mu- muscle if you hit that goal uh you know at least on average during the week uh over the course of a week hit your protein goal now the fat becomes kind of your variable right right um, and the more you eat, the when you're keto adapted, which we talk about, there's kind of three phases of keto adaption that we talk about as well. But once you're fully adapted, um, the bo- the body can use dietary fat or body fat equally. It doesn't matter. It can use either. Well, if you want to lose fat mass, you want it using more of the body fat for fuel, not dietary, right? And, and so you kind of it's. Uh, kind of a lever, right? You gotta you go up on fat in your diet, you use less off your body. You go down, you use more off your body. So it's there's a balance. It depends there. on your goals, you know, if you're suffering from cancer, yep. epilepsy. My kids eat keto, they eat well, I mean, but we don't limit the fat with them. What you know Yeah, and we have clients and this leads to another discussion in the book about the source of metabolic damage or uh, metabolic syndrome, which is inflamed fat cells. So we have clients that are 100 pounds and diabetic. Why is that? It's because they don't have a lot of fat cells. But they're filled. But they're all <laughs> stuffed oh, and inflamed, right. which causes insulin resistance because they, that fat cell doesn't want to take any more fat in. It's stuffed and it's inflamed and it's damaged. So They're it, trying to gain weight. It resists yeah. the insulin. Right, it, it rejects the the insulin, which causes you know diabetes, right? And you don't have a lot of of stored fat. But somebody else who has a lot of fat cells, whether one of the causes of this could be that they, uh, when they're very young, they had extra fat cells. So once you have more fat cells, you can put more fat into them, so they can actually get more overweight and still not be diabetic because their cells aren't inflamed yet. So that, sh- that explains the variability between, you know, those. But going back to the fat as a lever then, you know, again, uh, you know, if you're in maintenance mode, you, you ramp up the fat. If you're in weight loss mode, you want to get enough fat to help you stay satiated during the day, but not too much where you're not using that stored body fat for fuel. So it's a balance of finding that point. And that reminds me, I had a type 1 diabetic who was 30 years old. She just had her first child. And she was pretty much underweight, so she needed to gain some weight. And she said, Maria, I wish I gained weight when I cheated because I don't. I don't gain any weight, and we're a vain society. And for her, she was starting to have seizures. Her A1C was off the chart. It was super high. She did really well when she would stick to the diet. But again, she didn't have any visuals. She looked like the epitome of health, even though she wasn't. Um, she just said, I wish I would gain weight when I cheated because it would keep me on the diet because we are a vain society. Yeah. Is that, so I've, I've always heard that like skinny fat is more dangerous. Is that the reason it's more dangerous because people don't know that they're unhealthy or? Yeah, typically, typically because you're you're not gaining weight. You don't look, you know, uh, unhealthy and so they don't worry about it and they can, you know, damage themselves more and more. We get a lot of clients that actually are 
basically type one and type two because, because they, they were type twos for so long without dealing with it yep. that it, they burned out their beta cells and now they're wow. type one as well. Wow. So, you know, that, that can happen when you don't get that visual, that feedback of, you know, gaining weight. Right. You mentioned the three levels of uh, keto adaption. Kind yeah. Of, kind of walk us through those. Sure. Yeah. And we see this with clients and it, it, it really helps them, I think, in this book by explaining it, understand the process more. Because we're, again, a vain society. You, know, you want to go on this 21-day, you know, weight loss, weight loss <laughs> thing where you quickly, in 21 days, reverse t- 20 years of damage, right? That's the, the you know, marketing of it. But really, this is a lifestyle. And we want to, I think these stages really help people understand that. And we see it again and again with clients where when you restrict the carbohydrates down to, you know, maybe 20 grams a day, you will start throw, showing elevated blood ketones in two to three days. That's not a state where you're like really keto adapted because you'll still be sluggish. You'll still you're, you're making higher ketones. Um, well, looks like you're calling here. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry oh, about that. Oh, that's okay. You good? Okay. Uh, so you you in two or three days you start showing elevated ketones. Um, in the blood, but your body's not efficient at using those uh, ketones or free fatty acids for fuel yet as the primary fuel. And it takes about four to six weeks. And what actually happens are studies that I uh, reference in the book, your body actually makes more mitochondria. And if you look at the, the oxidation of fats versus glucose, fats are harder to oxidize, right? There's a little bit more of a process to it. And so by the, bo- the body, by making more mitochondria, it can oxidize more fat. And that's why after four to six weeks, performance equals out to, you know, when you're a glucose burner. Uh, because you make more mitochondria, your body gets more efficient at burning that fat and those ketones. And then you start to get that spike in uh, energy level and moods and mental clarity, all the things that come with being keto. And then <clears throat> there's continued improvements that happen over time. We, I say like, you know, in the months range, maybe six months, your body continues to get, you know, it's turning over more white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue, which is kind of like activating your fat, uh, which gives metabolic advantages. There's, you know, all these things that uh, happen down the road. And Volok and Finney even have a study that show one year after being keto, these athletes were seeing efficiency and performance improvements still so a year later they're still seeing in you know incremental improvements and we'll see this from clients too where two years after being keto all of a sudden they'll lose you know 10 more pounds and they they weren't expecting to lose anymore they didn't change anything their body just keeps you know ratcheting up you're talking about mitochondria and in the book we talk about different ways besides food that you can enhance your mitochondria. We talk about brown fat and activating that, like with cold therapy, you know, running out in the cold. We actually have a bathtub outside that we run cold water to, and you can take an ice bath outside um, because we're all about, you know, being outside, getting that sunlight, not being in fluorescent lights all the time, getting the vitamin D on and getting your cold therapy on. That's huge with activating brown fat. Yeah, well, you just live south of Canada anyway, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I thought. It's cold when, when you're not when you're not in Hawaii. Right? But you know, these hospitals are shooting up left and right. These cryotherapy yep. hospitals, and it's like, just go outside; it's free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, so let's uh, let's jump to hormones a little bit. So uh, I know Marie, you've uh, you've known a lot about horm- hormones in the past. Uh, did you learn anything new with the book or is that just an always ongoing learning? It's always ongoing learning on, you know, what happens and it's, you know, when you eat this food and this hormone and even like the timing of your eating, um, how intermittent fasting can enhance that human growth hormone, that fat burning hormone. Um, but I guess, yeah, like I told you, I grew up with PCOS and learning, all the different foods that really affect that. It's not just carbohydrates or sugar, it's also caffeine. Um, It's a little frustrating when we hear that, oh, caffeine will raise your ketone levels, but it's, it's affecting different hormones 
that are going to affect your weight if that's your goal. But it's also like there's women that are not overweight that still have PCOS and cutting caffeine is really important. I can't, I can't touch it. I still can't. Um, but just, uh, also studying sleep and how that affects your hormones. Um, something interesting was um, when we studied uh, sleep deprivation, even after only three nights of six hours or less, your cells start to look like a diabetic. And just how so many people are living in the state of six hours or less, right, and they think right. they're getting by on that. Um, and it's really not doing anybody's a favor when it, I mean, fasting is so much easier when you can sleep well. Um, and uh, it helps with leptin and ghrelin and all those different hormones, your thyroid, your adrenal hormones. Yeah. I get so many people saying they have adrenal fatigue and they're taking all these adrenal supplements. The best thing to do is get, you probably need nine, 10 hours of sleep to help restore those hormones. Yeah, yeah back I mean, to the, oh, go ahead, Craig. Back to the d disease tree. One of the big root causes, not enough sleep. Yeah, I mean, I, I read a lot about sleep, and there's a it, it, there's this uh, social jet lag uh, study. I think that's the name of it. Where, like, yeah, the, like you said, Maria, the average uh, sleep is like six hours. And the funny part is they they ask people the reality and their perception of sleep is so different because they'll say, "Well, how do you feel?" And I'm I'm like, and they'll say, "Well, I'm great," and then they'll monitor their sleep and it's very substandard. Right. And so, yeah. and then they supplement caffeine. And so, <laughs> it, it, I mean, that's how you get through your day Psycho. when you're, and, and talking about sleep. I, I mean, I know this from personal experience when you're sleep deprived, you, you crave carbs. So oh, yeah. talk a little bit about the science behind that because people know it, but your body actually is craving the glucose, right? For the energy. Well, well, Craig can talk about the science, but I was just going to say, if I'm at a wedding or a party and we're out late and I, I'm always up early, I love the sun, I get up, you know, early on at 5 a.m. on a Sunday just because I, that's the way I roll. But I go to bed quite early, except for when we're at a party. And even I, who stick to the ketogenic diet, I am so much hungrier yep. throughout the day. Fasting becomes almost a failure, if <laughs> you want to call it that. But I feel like I'm a bottomless pit, and I hear it from everybody. But, yeah, there's a lot of science to it. Yeah, like she's saying, you know, we typically eat, like, two meals a day. We eat, you know, on a kind of an intermittent fasting kind of schedule. It's just natural. Um, and, yeah, if I don't get good sleep one night, man, I, will, I won't be able to do that. You know, I'll, I'll have to eat an extra meal or I'm just a lot more hungry. And it's that it's, there, there's so much that goes on when you sleep like and a big one of them is human growth hormone that is highest uh that like four fun. hours after falling asleep uh or 30 minutes yeah. after falling asleep um if you want to go oh yeah more, and that's like a, that's a big component of it <laughs> it is um you know that's that that you don't want to eat right before bed because that all of our hormones run like waves of the ocean you hear about weight loss is all about hormone manipulation yeah it is and you can manipulate those with the what you eat the timing of you when you eat when you exercise um, there's a lot of different components that go on with this even caffeine are gonna that's gonna affect all of them um, but leptin and ghrelin the hormones that tell you that you're satiated and the hormone that tells the gurgle, the ghrelin, it tells you that you're hungry. Those are significantly ghrelin is significantly higher um, even after one night of six or less hours of sleep. Um, so I always ask people, so what's your goal? Because everybody's doing keto for something different, and they'll I would say 99% of the time say they want to lose weight. You know, be healthy and lose weight. And, you know, diving down, peeling back the onion, finding out about their sleep, I'll say, okay, I know what your goal is, but if we get, you know, good sleep and, you know, we get you to go number two every day, all that, everything's going to fall into place. Um, but sometimes it's not being able to fall asleep, um, looking into all the blue light that we're exposed right. to. We have the old fashioned blue blocker glasses. Um, Me too. Yeah. You know, and doing cold therapy before bed is huge. We even have a chili pad on our mattress. Do you know what a chili pad is? 
chili, Pat? Yeah. It's like this. It's a it's a mattress cover with little tubes that run through it, and it goes down to a unit that's basically an air conditioner. Oh. It's cool. It cools, runs cool water through the bed, and keeps you, keeps the bed cooler at night. It's yeah. great. And and the reason behind that is because your body needs cool to sleep well, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I got the blackout curtains and the yeah. blue, blue blockers and all that. I keep it cool. But um, if you have if you have a bunch of city light blasting you, and your room's hot, and you have your computer on, and you have your iPhone next to your bed. That's not a good situation. So, no. and you know what I tell my friends is that you, th- you might think that you sleep well, but the quality is quantity and quality are both important in sleep. Oh, we, we get all the time where people will, clients will be like, I'm having such vivid dreams all of a sudden, you know, right, right. like they, they haven't had that forever Ever. because they've, they've never, never remembered their been dreams. getting those deep, you know, REM type of sleep. They were never getting that. And it's so important to get to that, you know, deep state and let your body recover and heal. And But, you you know, asking about hormones, um, not just the sleep aspect, but that kind of ties in the exercise chapter. The exercise chapter is different, but um, there's even a part of the dangers of over-exercising. And because I was guilty of that. I was running marathons, running in the morning and in the afternoon doing two-a-days all the time without a break. And all of a sudden I started, even though I was running maybe, you know, 20 miles a day, I was putting weight on, even though I was eating keto and really well um, and looking into the cortisol hormones and how I was raising that in the afternoon. And that's when it should start be falling. You know, I was messing up those adrenal hormones. Um, And so teaching you how to exercise in a way that you enjoy it. And then, cause I mean, you want to enjoy life. You want to be happy doing it, but teaching you in a way that you're still gonna, you know, get that rise of human growth hormone. You're going to get your muscle tone going, you know, muscles aren't built on keto alone. You know, you have to build that and that brings into the healthy bones, you know, the, the muscles and the healthy bones and all of that. And that, that's a great lead into, uh, you have a chapter on the common mistakes. So what, yeah. what are the most, uh, common mistakes you see, not only in keto, but you, you brought up a great point about exercise and sleep. And w- what do you guys typically see? Um, that is people that they think it's positive is actually negative. Talk a little bit about that. Oh my gosh. Where should we start? Um, <laughs> I guess my big thing is, uh, dairy and nuts those are considered very ketogenic foods. And for a lot of people, um, they are holding people back from weight loss and they're both constipating. I know that, you know, nobody wants to talk about poo, but it's a big deal of what's going on inside. And one of the most common questions I get or complaints is, okay, I started keto and now I'm constipated. I'm not going number two. And I was like, are you eating dairy and nuts? Because those two things are super constipating. Um, but they also inhibit a lot of weight loss, the carbohydrates and nuts and nut flours. If you're making muffins out of almond flour and all of that type of stuff, um, we don't really have those in the house. Um, you know, that's gonna, those carbohydrates add up very quickly. You have to count in total if you want to be successful. Uh, don't count nuts. That's a big misconception right there. Um, but also, you know, dairy. Um, someone said, yeah, I live off of, when I travel, I live off of macadamia nuts dipped in cream cheese. And I was like, well. well yeah, nuts and, and then dairy. Yeah. <laughs> we have to revamp this. But, um, you know, but they're easy. Uh, so that's something that, you know, I never, in our, my, our meal plans, we don't have dairy or nuts. Um for our clients just because yeah. it is, you know, they're, uh, dairy, we all poo poo gluten, you know, that's like no gluten, right? But dairy is actually a more common allergen than gluten is. Um, but since it is a high fat food without any carbohydrates and we live in Wisconsin, so it's like blasphemy to say, don't eat yeah. cheese, you know? Yeah. Um, but it is a, it is a big deal, especially if you have any type of skin disorders like eczema, um, it's important to try to cut those out. And and nuts the, are, and nuts are really deceptive too. You talked about oh yeah. ma- macadamia nuts. That I mean, they're a good food, uh, you know, from a ketogenic standpoint or whatever. But uh, 
one handful is like I don't know 420 calories or something. Yeah, you know, there's a picture I saw where is two handfuls, and you could they didn't look the same. They didn't look that different, but one was twice the calories of the other one. You know, we're not talking calories in, calories out, but it is physics. I mean, so it makes sense. And that's that's another one of the common misconceptions I think is, and it's almost kind of a you know this high fat low carb kind of moniker. It's almost a little bit. uh, It's too bad it's called that, just because. Uh, I think you know calling it ketogenic is 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 a better way to term it. But the reason it, it can cause trouble is that they think the fat has to be high in the diet to be ketogenic. Yeah, yeah. yeah great point. That's not true. And I, I list a a whole bunch of ways you can be ketogenic without having high fat in the diet. You can have a big bowl of white rice and put a bunch of MCT oil on it and read ketones. Are you in lipolysis? No. And that's why we say, what is your goal? Because if it's to, you know, again, if you have epilepsy, you know, seizures, cancer, MS, we're not going to limit that fat, you know, but if weight loss is your goal, putting MCT oil on white rice is not a good idea. Yeah. Um, but, but you show high ketones. Right, but right. That That's not the goal. And a little bit of this, too, is, you know, not to chase that ketone level because there is absolutely zero evidence that correlates a specific ketone level to weight loss. results, mm-hmm. to weight loss. So you could lose weight when your ketones are 0.3 or when they're 3.0. It doesn't – so – that level, that's just a kind of a supply and demand fuel supply, right? It's how much fuel is being generated and fuel versus how much is being used. It's the and difference I, my, of the I'm guilty supply. of that. I work out and exercise, exercise in a fasted state. And so my ketones dip really low, really, really low. But you know what? They go right back up when you stop. So don't, and yeah. so many people say, well, I didn't eat 80% fat. There's this idea that this piece of the pie, you need 80% fat. I didn't eat 80%, so I was doing shots of MCT oil before bed. And I was like, let it come from your body, because if you keep ingesting it, then there's no need for it to go to the harder process of utilizing your body fat for fuel. And that's what I was saying about that moniker of high fat, low carb. What's important to understand is the high fat part comes from dietary and your own body fat when you're trying to lose weight. And even a and lean so person has a lot. And so even if you're lower in dietary fat than the 80%, you're still using 80% because the other the part of it is coming from your stored body fat being used as fuel. So you're still getting 80% fat. It's just some of it's coming from your body. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that's uh, that's really hard for people to understand that, you know, uh, and MCT, a tablespoon is like 110 calories too, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, well, it's like bulletproof coffees, you know, some of these people will put, you know, a couple tablespoons of MTT, a tablespoon of butter and then some cream. And it's like, and they say they're fasting get, it, until right. noon. And it's like, well, you just ate 500 calories, but you know, you, you put all this in and it's 400 and some calories of drink. And you're telling me if you sat down and had eight eggs, which is the same calories, Which is a, you know, about the same amount of calories that you want. I, I don't know if I'd eat again all day if I had eight eggs yeah. in right. one sitting. And that, you know, the nutrient density plays in that part where you get a lot more nutrients in consuming real food yeah. than shooting a shot of oil. But not just that, um, that comes back to the hormones is that chewing your food, you talk about nuts, I want to say that the reason why nuts are really easy to overeat, there's something called sensory specific satiety, which is kind of hard to say, but you feel that crunch in your ears and it causes an addictive personality going on. That happens with chips, nuts, whatever's crunchy. Uh. But chewing your food actually registers leptin and ghrelin much better than drinking calories it tell it's very satiating the whole act of chewing and swallowing sensors things in your brain to tell you that you've eaten that you're full and satisfied um instead of just drinking a bunch of calories and back there's a whole i wanted to make a whole chapter on nutrient density because I think this is a very important part of the book as well that uh, is kind of been lost in common knowledge out there. How you need all these veggies. Um, yeah, how, you know, so the, you know, I think what happened is 
we had these kind of not good studies that pointed a finger at red meat as being bad, right? So the mainstream thought is that we got to avoid red meat. Well, if we do that, where are we going to get our nutrients? You got to add lots of fruits and veggies to get your nutrients, right? Well, if you backpedal from that and look at the the real science behind everything and you look at meat by itself, it's it's really nutrient dense. And it, uh, if you look at across the spectrum of vitamins and minerals, all those micronutrients. They beat kale it, like no other. Yeah, you know, it's, there's all kinds of charts Amen. in the book. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and everybody's so afraid of organ meat. Um, you know, like liver blows everything oh, off it, the chart. It's a super, super food. It's not, you know, goji berries or something. It's liver. Like it crushes just about any other food out there. And so incorporating that kind of nose to tail eating really is a super high nutrient dense way of eating. And people don't realize that. They don't look at a steak and think, look at all the vitamins and minerals I'm getting. But it is. But there, but it's there. And so that's, you know, I wanted to make sure to have this whole chapter to kind of fo- bring that to light. Because people think of potassium, they think of bananas or yeah. potatoes or an avocado, Mm-mm, beef. Yeah, beef yeah. has got just as much potassium as yeah. any of them. So well, I am on the right track. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and our last few moments, uh, Maria, uh, maybe both of you talk about uh, the no cooking recipes. What what kind of brought that about? Is it just people have a hard time cooking? So. Um. Yeah. I mean, I don't like to clean, so I can't judge people that don't like to cook. Um. I, I love to cook. It comes easy for me. Uh, but I understand that we live in a society that they don't even take time to sleep. They don't want to take time to cook. And, you know, either, like I meet a lot of people traveling that travel all the time for work. And they're just looking for really easy things. And I get it. I mean, we're really busy. And so we just, um, I mean, he's the mastermind behind making, I mean, he's the science guy that makes the percent, the macros perfect and everything. So, um, you know, just working together with things that are tasty. I don't want, nobody wants to eat bark, right? Um, things that are tasty and yet super easy to make this a successful way of eating. So, yep, so we, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, give us an example of something that's like for a, tra- a traveler. Yeah, you know, so now in in these meal plans, there's hard-boiled eggs. And people say, well, I got to cut those. You can get hard-boiled eggs at the at store. At a gas station. You know, and, and at stores. But like smoked salmon, so, I'm, a, I'm a fan of smoked salmon big time. And we eat that a lot when we travel because I don't like regular salmon, but anything smoked is awesome. So we do a lot of smoked fish, but you can buy all of that right. um, and get wild caught and stuff yeah, without or, sugar. You know, a little bit of an egg salad type thing or chicken salad where you get- Tuna the, salad. Get, a, get some chicken cooked cook chicken breast and you mix in some mayo and the and pork yes. rinds have gone from bark tasting to really good <laughs> ones that like pork yeah. clouds and epic they all make really good that don't taste stale and gross yeah yeah so, like we have a, we have a whole foods uh near near us and everything you're describing like yeah you can actually eat you can eat pretty well now and not even yeah not even yeah cook. Yeah, yeah and and the key was just you know getting so the you know you're hitting a good protein number, yeah. keeping the carbs really low, and getting a, a range of fat that'll help them lose weight. You know, which is what the goal is. So. I just took a picture of my pantry this morning to post on Instagram, and there's uh, my kids love sardines. There's smoked oysters in there. There's uh, smoked mackerel. I mean, these are all like that you can get in little tins. Oh, right. And I know they sound weird, but once you you know, open up that palate. I was the pickiest eater. Like I seriously. And now, um, your, your palate will change if you give it a chance. And so are your kids. Oh, and one other thing I want to make sure to add is, uh, you know, somebody's going to say, well, if you're not getting all these veggies, where are you getting your fiber from? (laughs) Number one, I think fiber is overrated. And there's a whole thing about that in the book, but fiber, uh, typically people talk about on a ketogenic diet to feed the gut flora, right, as a prebiotic. Well, guess what? Um, plant fiber is not even close to collagen for being a prebiotic. Collagen is much more uh, fermentable. Our favorite so, ways to get that, baby back ribs. And so, you know, <laughs> you're eating those connective parts, the, the wings, the ribs, sardines, you know, eating in the bones and the connective parts, you're getting a ton of prebiotic for the 
for the gut flora. So then you don't need the fiber. And if you think about newborn babies, they don't get any fiber. And they go number two all the time. Yeah. That's not the issue when it comes to constipation. Yeah. Fiber <laughs> actually can cause bulk to the stools and cause more pain going on. Yeah. Usually it's salt if they have constipation. Salt. Not yeah. having Because they're not hydrated enough. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, we are running out of time, but I want you to talk about how uh, people can find your book, how they can find you, kind of take us through all the channels. Well, we're very grateful that you had us. Um, I have a blog with, I don't know, thousand plus recipes um, and tips and tricks at mariamindbodyhealth.com. We also have a Facebook. Yep. Uh, and there's a... Uh, Just Keto Adapted. Yeah, Keto Adapted <laughs> is our Facebook page. And then we have a, a web page that's a support group where they can have, get a subscription and get support from us. That's keto-adapted.com. We do weekly Sunday meetings, and everybody can ask their questions, yeah. and it's All a nice support. community, yeah. And then uh, one thing I want to point out, we talked a lot about the keto book. Coming out just before it is actually a dairy-free, e quick and easy book. It's yeah. called what? It's Easy Dairy-Free Keto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's really like... Um, being from Wisconsin, I know that you love that mouthfeel of dairy and all of that. So I try to create easy recipes that still give you that taste and mouthfeel that, so you don't miss it. Yeah. So when does your book come out? Keto comes out January 9th. January 9th. Yeah. It's a well-written it, book. It's, it's definitely, uh, uh, yeah. comprehensive in every way. It was pushed out a month because of international interest. And so they wanted to make sure that um, they ramped up. We enough. ramped up and we just uh, decided to wait. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks. Oh, any, then, any closing we, comments from either one of you? I was just saying the Easy Dairy Free comes out actually a week before that. So January 2nd. But we're just but, grateful for everybody. I mean, most people don't know that. I mean, there was a time when we had nothing and we lost everything. And we're very grateful for all the love and support. And we love helping people. So if you do have questions, feel free to ask them on Facebook. We're really quick to respond. And for me personally, it's been quite a journey. I, I got to a point where I worked for Honeywell and I was working for the military, making, you know, systems and stuff for the military. And to go from something like that to the, the reward that I get from helping people now has been a really an amazing journey. That is so. quite a change. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, Maria and Craig, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day. You too. Bye.